All right, hello and welcome. My name is Kate Gibson and I'm the Associate Director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Mark Arax to the Lane Center to discuss his book, The Dreamt Land, Chasing Water and Dust Across California. Mark Arx is an author and journalist who has been called a 21st century John Steinbeck for his books that pry open the soul of California. Mark is a two-time winner of the California Book Award and a recipient of Stanford's William Soroyan International Prize for Writing. A son of the San Joaquin Valley with family roots in farming, Mark earned a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University and began his journalism career at the Baltimore Evening Sun before returning home to write for the Los Angeles Times. Mark's most recent work uh, and the subject of today's talk is a national bestseller and has been critically acclaimed. Felicia Marcus will moderate today's discussion. Felicia is the William C. Landreth Visiting Fellow at Stanford's Water in the West program. Before her time at Stanford, Felicia held a range of positions in government, the nonprofit sector, and the private sector, dealing with a range of environmental issues with a focus on water. Most recently, she served as the chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. She is currently a fellow at the National Academy of Public Administration and a founding member of the Water Policy Group. The event will begin with a conversation between Mark and Felicia on the book. After this, in the last 15 to 20 minutes, the speakers will be taking questions from the audience. Please use the webinar's Q&A function located on the bottom bar to submit your questions throughout our webinar today. Live captioning is available for this event. To access the captions, please click the CC icon located at the bottom bar. The center is excited to host today's conversation on water in California. At this time, Felicia, I'll turn the program over to you. Thanks a lot, Kate. And thanks to both the Bill Lane Center for the American West and the Water in the West program for co-hosting this, this uh, program. I have to say, I'm, I'm I'm honored to do this, and I know at the outset there's just not going to be enough time. I'm, I'm delighted to get the chance to speak with Mark and to give you all a chance to ask questions of this remarkable writer who's really unlike any other. As Kate said, The Dreamt Land has gotten a phenomenal reception, as have all of Mark's works. And in the time we have, I hope that our conversation can illuminate a bit about Mark and his writing, along with gaining some insight into the people and the issues in the Central Valley. Because so many of our, our audience are also writers, all, albeit of a different kind than Mark, I'm gonna start with some questions about writing that I think will be interesting to any reader, but in particular to people who, who, uh, who struggle with the craft of writing of whatever kind. I'll then move into questions about the Central Valley's people politics and future. And I'm going to try and watch the clock to be leaving time for your questions that you all have put into the Q&A box. Um, I've also asked Mark to pick a couple of passages to read to punctuate this hour together. And I asked him to do it not because I couldn't find one, but because there were so many I could have chosen. And so I decided to ask Mark to just read us a couple, um, a, a couple passages from the book. So let me just dive right in, if, if that's all right with you, Mark. Thank you for coming, of course. Thanks. Well, thanks, Kate. Thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be with, with you guys. We're really happy about it. Uh, let me just put it this way. There, there is no one quite like you as a writer. You've been termed a historian, a biographer, an autobiographer, a poet, a journalist, and a lot of other things. How would you characterize your style of writing, and how did you come to it? Well, there's no one who writes like me because I'm me. I mean, each writer is an individual. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm confused about a lot of stuff because I started off as a journalist and I wouldn't call myself a historian. I mean, when I think of the historian, one that I really like, it's uh, like Richard White at Stanford, who is a fine writer himself. He's one of my favorite historians. Um, so I've been accused of throwing in everything, the kitchen sink too. Uh, my style, let's see. My, so my grandfather was a, a poet. Um, he hid in an attic in Istanbul in 1916, 17, 18 with a bunch of books. Maupassant, Baudelaire, Verlaine, and this is how he outlasted the Armenian genocide. And um, 
his poetry got interrupted by the genocide and then by a life of farming when he came to California. Uh, he was a friend of Soroyan and he introduced me to Soroyan at a young age and I would go visit William Soroyan in his side-by-side -side track houses in West Fresno. He spent half the year in Paris and half in Fresno. And I would just go there and, and visit him and it was remarkable to just walk into his, his place of writing. It was his living room. He sat up when he wrote on a draftsman's table on a royal typewriter. And he had all this collection of stuff, these oddments um, that he collected on his bicycle rides through Fresno. He didn't drive a car. And he collected twine and shards of glass and uh, rocks. And I asked him, you know, why the rocks? And he said, I collect rocks to remind myself that art should be simple. And um, so at some point I started asking him, you know, questions that a would-be writer would ask a master. And um, I remember telling him, you know, a little bit about what I was trying to do. And, and his recommendation was to, to write about what you know in the language that you know it, which I thought was kind That's of tough. interesting. And it didn't really occur to me what that meant at the time. And then I remember telling him, it's, it's one time I was in my late teens, and I told him that I was collecting, making this grand list of vocabulary words, a thousand words and more. And my latest entry was the word ubiquitous. And he, he had a kind, he, kind of a funny look on his face. And he said, why in the hell, where in the hell would you need to use the word ubiquitous? He said, count all my short stories, my novels, my musings. I use 300 words, that's all. It's not the number of words you bring to the page. It's the music you bring to the words. And so that was a great lesson. And I've tried to do that. And I've evolved from journalists to, you know, more, more intricate kinds of writing, uh, but always, uh, you know, with that kind of voice of, of Soroyan in my head. That's great. That's great. You can see it and you can see the music in your writing, which is really spectacular. Well, okay, so how do you decide what to write about? I mean, it takes a lot to write a book or even one of your long articles. Uh, my guess is you have a long list of possible things you think about that I, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to tell me and uh, tell us what you're going to do next, even though we all want to know. But how do those ideas coalesce and coalesce into a larger project for you? I mean, moving from journalism and magazine writing to writing a book, completely different things. We even already have a question about yeah, that well, in the- you know, Yeah, my, my first book was uh, going back and telling the story of my father's unsolved murder when I was 15. And that became, it was like Moby Dick for me. I mean, I, and w when I read it, I wince because I tried to fit too much in, mm -hmm. but I taught myself a kind of a, a narrative. And really what I'm, looking for is kind of the intersection between the personal and the land. So it's something that allows me to tell the story of, of this place. And I started in the backyard of Fresno, expanded out to the whole of California. So something that allows me to tell the story of the invention and the myriad in reinventions of California and, and our imprint, you know, my, my family's mark on, on the dirt, the soil. That, that kind of is where I get my inspiration. And, and I, you know, I think about, you know, East Coast novelist writers, they tend to dwell on interiors, I, I think. You know, geography is a living room, a, a bedroom, a psychiatrist's office. Uh, you know, if you're writing about the West, um, from the West, uh, I think you have to account for the land. It becomes... Mm a character of chief concern. So, so you you bubbles up from, yeah. So so was that move was the wanting to write the story of your father's unsolved murder the thing that brought you into deciding to write a whole book rather than a, being a journalist or writing longer magazine articles? Yeah, I, I think um you know, when I was 15 and, and you get that kind of a hole ripped into your narrative, I tried to fill it by uh, by telling, g gathering the stories of our family. So I went around at the age of 15, 16 with this tape recorder 
and started recording my grandfather's and their whole journey out of genocide and, and, and arriving here in what they called the new Armenia at the foot of the Sierra and the San Joaquin Valley. And I just kept, you know, that, that, that tape recorder, I've, you know, I've recorded 800 hours of oral histories with it. You know, the Black Okies who came west, I have 200 hours of their oral histories. Thank goodness I gathered them. They followed the Cotton Trail West because they're all gone now. Uh, Latinos uh, who came in the 1920s to pick cotton in the Tulare Lake Basin. All these oral histories I have I've gathered on these tapes. The tapes are starting to degrade a little bit. I, I need to raise some money to, uh, to digitize them and preserve them because it's quite a history. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's those narratives that, that trying to tell the story in a different way than journalism allowed. Um, and, and even when I joined up with the, the first newspaper, I always wanted to do longer pieces, more challenging narratives. Um, you know, so I would disappear for months at a time in a newspaper. The LA Times was great back in the day because I'd take off for a year or two doing these stories. Um, you know, one story in an entire year, that, that just doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. That's unfortunate. Well, how do, how do you go about doing this? How do you go about writing? Do you lock yourself in a room for a certain number of hours a day, write a certain number of words a day, write when the mood strikes you, mine some of the oral histories and other notes you've taken on things? I mean, and do you do a lot of editing or does it just come out in that amazing flow of words that is your unique style? No, that was, you know, um, I, I don't. I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of, I don't know if, if I call it editing, but what I do is I you know, not to get boring here, but I, I try to have two writing days. I get up in the morning and do some writing. And I usually start with answering emails or something that kind of uh, limbers me up a little bit. And then I, um, and then I'll start writing and I'll get a good three, four hours in and then I get tired. And so what I do is I end up taking a nap. I wake up from the nap, uh, do a workout. And I feel like at that point I have a second writing day. And sometimes if I get obsessed, I'll write you know, I'll take a break for dinner, then I'll write till, you know, midnight, and I'll read what I've, when I'm tired, I'll read what I've written, because the tired me has no patience for BS. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that I have, so the, the tired me has a good BS de detector. And I end up saying, oh, man, this, what I wrote isn't quite what I want to say, but I can't fix it. I'm too tired. So I'll wake up the next morning and fix and fix what I think were, I, I got wrong. You know, you fool yourself and you have to fool yourself because how do you go from the one sentence to the next? You pretend that the last sentence you wrote is the perfect one and it isn't. But you, mm -hmm. if you believe that you move on and then you go back and then you really move on. <laughs> that can, I could see the flow then as an ebb and flow that eventually it's what, two steps forward, one step back or something yeah. over time. Well, how do you, how do you uh, balance or think about the interaction of the subject matter you're choosing and the style you use? Okay, I, this that's interesting because your 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 sound isn't the same in everything you write. No, I I think when I'm um, when I'm writing about people, I, I really get their voice in my head, um, and not just the, the the voice, but the rhythm, the cadence. And sometimes, um, and, and oftentimes, when I'm writing a piece, or even uh, in, 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 you know, as I'm moving through a book, their voices will kind of meld with mine, and um, and I will write in their voice in a way, or at least their voice meeting my voice. And so cadence changes and things like that. I I find that um, you know it's not. I, I don't try to do it in a patronizing way. It's just kind of this weird twining that takes place. And well, uh, I have their, their voices in my head. The, the other lesson I learned reading uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, hmm. uh, he, 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 he said that, um, that and I, I wrote this down, that he, he never wanted to read a page and see the writer writing. Sentences should not call attention to themselves. And it's, it's, it's only the flow that that you want the reader following, and I, I think what he was saying is that 
you don't there's a spell that you don't want to break um, by seeing the writer's toil the writer's sweat and so I, I think the the best writing is stuff that kind of disappears in a way and it's just the storytelling that ends up you know being on the page the actual exertion the 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 the, the effort of writing you don't want to see that may be a bit of why it it the the focus on the people seems so profound in your stories and maybe just even subconsciously reading it feels more like you're there with the character as you're taking the character across a page or two or three or more i mean these people in the valley really um they they have a, a vernacular an idiom i mean i grew up when i would see um you know i'd see friends or family from the east coast they'd say i had a twang on my tongue and i guess i did i, I grew up with a lot of dust bowl kids uh, Dust Bowl white, Dust Bowl black, Dust Bowl Latino, and we all had this weird twang. So I, I think that 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 vernacular, even the idiom, um, I think, gets conveyed when you're writing at, at, at that intersection there. Well, I, I want to ask you a question that sort of straddles the sort of two halves of this conversation, and and ask you what. What made you choose to write the dreamt plan? And what did you have in mind? And did what you have in mind in writing it, what did you write it, what you what you what you intended when you started on this journey end up being what you wrote? So I had written a book with a, one of my best friends, and I think it's remarkable that we came out of it even better friends, Rick Wartsman. Um, I, after my first book of my father, I went out and I saw, I went and saw this flood that happened in 96, 97. And a colleague, mine, well. yeah, a colleague of mine at the LA Times, yeah, that said, hey, um, Tulare Lake has come back to life. And I thought, well, what the hell is Tulare Lake? Mm -hmm. So I pulled out a map and he said, uh, put your finger near Corcoran. And I did. And there was this lake. And it was the oddest lake because it was painted blue, but it was completely square. Um, which spoke to what I later discovered was the remarkable engineering of that lake. So um, I went down and, 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 and got this idea for a second book. And it really was the story, as it turned out, of how the plantation south came west. These cotton growers in Georgia and Mississippi, they had been chased out of the south by the boll weevil, and they landed west. J.G. Boswell, the colonel, came west and put down roots in the Tulare Lake Basin. Tulare Lake was the biggest body of fresh water west of the Mississippi. And, but the siphoning, the early siphoning of those rivers for agriculture in the 1880s, 1890s, had really dried up its flow, okay? And it was on its last leg, and the Boswells and the Salyers ended up completely drying it up by damming the Kings River, the Thule River, the Kauia River. And it became the, one of the, you know, the, the richest cotton patches in the world. And they brought their black cotton pickers to pick. And this became this, um, this rising of a plantation in the West. And it, and it really transformed the economy, um, just the feel of the place. When I grew up here, I wondered why this place felt, you know, partly the South and partly the Southwest. It had Texas, it had, you know, all these places in it, Oklahoma, sure. And that was the story. So after um, about a year into that book, Rick was working for the Wall Street Journal covering the Clinton administration and said, how's the book going? I said, this is gonna take me 10 years. And a lot of it takes place in Washington where the politics were mm -hmm. build the dams. To, uh, and it, it became not the bureau building those dams, but the Army Corps of, of Engineers, because they declared the lake a flood zone. And this is how the Army Corps came in and built it. So Rick jumped in and started helping me. We worked this book together. And at the end of it, the King of California, uh, the, the, the making of a secret American empire, um, you know, I decided, God, I don't want to do water anymore. So I kind of purged all of water from my brain went on 
and <laughs> good luck a, with that. <laughs> yeah, I did a book of essays and stuff like that. And then this drought comes. So it wasn't flood. This this the, the inspiration for this book was drought. And I noticed, you know, as happens, um, journalists kind of parachuted in from the east and other places. And they were writing about, you know, apocalypse in California, but they just, you know, it's hard to come in and fly into a place as complicated as this and get it right. And I was really frustrated reading the stories. And so I decided, okay, well, um, you know, let's tell this story, but broaden it. It's not my backyard. It's not Tulare Lake. It's the whole of California. And uh, let's build on that first narrative and write a whole new one. So that, that was how that, that book came about. That's how this book, The Dreamt Land, came about. See, now you can see why we all want to know where you're going next, but I'll let you keep that to yourself. Um, no, that's great. That's, that, that makes total sense, having read it. Well, I, I asked you to read a patch, passage in this transition zone, and I can't wait to hear what you picked. So I, actually, your last question tees it up perfectly, because this is me deciding to write this uh, this book. So, and why? Great. Now the worst drought in the history of white man's California has me dwelling on the capture of water again. Only this time about a system that extends beyond Tulare Lake to the whole of the state and its history. Extraction was how California was conceived in myth, myth and then born again as a real place. Each taking of a resource, the body of the native, river, mineral, element, soil, allowed for the next taking. In the continuum of reinvention, if I dug down, I could spot my own family's story. The ranch as a rebirth out of genocide, the lopping off of farm, to embrace suburbia, the premature end of a rural life for which my grandfather never forgave America because it took the life of my father, and so on. This is the way it always begins, at least for me, the searching out of one's own story in the larger story, the personal, a means to find the communal, and vice versa so that each might have a chance to keep the other honest, though who knows where it might go after that. My assumptions at the outset are few. Water binds us and pulls us apart. A land this crazy makes people crazy. 100 million acres takes a while to screw up. Highest mountain, lowest desert, longest coast, most epic valley, riparian forest, redwood forest, Douglas fir forest, wetland grassland, and inland sea. The rain falls 125 inches a year in one place and five inches a year in the other place. When the latitudes, when the lines of latitude cover 10 degrees in the topographical regions, number 11. What are a people to do? They can honor the distinctions and allow each region to exist within its own plenitude and limit. Or they can draw a line around the whole, count it as one state, and begin their infinite tinkering to even out the differences. And so we moved the rain. <laughs> That's great. That's great. It does answer the question, but it also encapsulates so much that's there, both of the, the personal and the, the, the concrete and actual of what we've done over time. So that, that perfect. Thank you. And I, I remember that we moved the rain. That was really great. Well, well, let me, let me move into the subject matter of the book, um, but go maybe a little bit broader on some of it. Um, with, uh, with everyone here. I mean, it, it, not just in the dreamt land, although that is the, the broadest of them, but you've written extensively about the Central Valley of California 
at more depth than any of your contemporaries. And it feels like you've researched more histories as well. I love the research you've done that you scatter in to the book that underpins a lot of it. I mean, many of us who follow and have worked in the Central Valley learn something new every time we read anything you've written. While at the same time, and this is one of the great things, we're clearly recognizing things that we know or have encountered ourselves uh, in the Valley. And in fact, when reading about California water in general, many of us, well, I could just speak for myself, I get irritated that so much that's written about the Valley is wrong factually or something that cries out for a footnote or a caveat or something, um, but that rarely happens when reading your prose. But the other thing that always jumps out at me um, is about your writing is at the same time you may clearly be critiquing a person or a person's actions or the actions of a group, you're also humanizing those people and illuminating and creating a framework for why they may say something differently than others do. So you, you're, you're, I know I've said this a few times, but you bring this intensely human quality to your work versus the sort of um, bumper sticker, talking point, clash of the titans, uh, or overgeneralizations that many writers or advocates inevitably bring to a discussion of California, let alone the Central Valley in particular. And so I, I, I see you as someone who, who is trying to chronicle the Central Valley, but also illuminate it as it is, versus jumping on a, on a bandwagon. And, um, I suppose that was a long setup to my question, which is, you know, there's clearly not one Central Valley, although people talk about it as if it's a monolith. There's not one view in agriculture, which is something you and I have talked about in the past. And yet the talking point discourse at the pol even at the policy level, let alone along the signs on the I-5, seem as if the Central Valley is a monolith. Um, how do you describe the variety of worldviews in the Central Valley? And, and what do you think the greatest influences are determining those different world views? Yeah, I think it's pretty easy to paint the whole place with one brush, but I, I don't think that's accurate. Um, you know, when you're 300 miles away and you're, you're, you're thinking of a, of a farmer on, in the Westlands Water District who owns 20,000 acres of farm, you know, you're thinking of him as some corporate, you know, uh, entity. Uh, but then when you get up close with that person on the land, like I did with uh, Jack Wolf, he was 100 years old, walking his uh, tomato fields, uh, it, it gets a little more complicated. And it's not so easy to paint him in, in a way that is cardboard or evil. So yeah, the, the valley, I mean, the San Joaquin Valley feels very much different than the Sacramento Valley. I mean, as soon as you cross into Stockton, as you're going north, it just feels different. It smells different. It is different. The industrialization of agriculture is not the same as it is in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley, let's just take that. I mean, it's not one valley either. It's like uh, three, if not four valleys. Let's say we start at the on the eastern east side of the valley, the uh, where the Sierras are, the prettiest side of the valley. Those rolling hills that are quilted in um, in in mandarins and other citrus. Um, small towns, Exeter, Visalia, places like that, where farmers and farm workers, the children of the two, go to school together. And the, um, you have a, a farming operation that has 60, 80 acres of citrus, and that's enough for a very good living. You could send three kids to, you know, to, 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 to college with that. Um, so, and the water is is there. It's available. You don't you, you know, you have rivers running through that land. So that's one place. And then the center valley, you have something similar. Again, rivers running through the land. Uh, if you're drawing groundwater from the recharge of those rivers, your wells are only reaching 70, 80 feet deep and it's getting recharged often. And these are the towns of Fowler and Selma and Kingsburg the raisin capitals of the world, although the raisin is now given way to the almond. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, for you know whatever Jeffersonian that ideal is, whatever it means today, 
these are kinds of the rising of those kinds of farms, family farms, although that's changing too. Uh, the third and fourth generations don't want to farm, and now those farmers are selling out to hedge funds and pension funds and bigger operations. Then you move to the west side, and the, the distance between east side and west side is 40 miles, but it's like a world apart. There are no rivers running through the west side. The kind of extraction, the wells are, 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 are reaching sometimes 1,000, 2,000 feet deep for water. And the towns, the farmers don't live in those towns. The farmers live in my zip code in Fresno, 93711. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's really heavily, you know, the, the, the towns are very impoverished. And I feel that it has something to do with the geographic distance that the farmer has from that ground, because that geographic distance becomes a kind of psychic dis dif distance. And the idea that this is my place, I live here, I'm responsible for it a place like Huron, Mendota. It's not the same when you're living in Fresno, in Fig Garden area of Fresno. So yeah, the valley, so to be true to this place and to paint it truly, you, you have to get into those, those cracks and crevices and explain to readers that when you come here, you may think you're arriving in a, in, in a singular place, but it has its differences as well. Well, how do you, how do you see the, do you see any one, oh, I have too many questions to ask, uh, any one worldview as being dominant, or do you think there are many worldviews in the valley? So those differences are all based on a different relationship to water. When you have an easy draw of water, the, the, um, the, the, the sanity of the farming is, is, is just, it's, it's more sane. When you have a, a difficult draw of water, it becomes more problematic, mad, insane. Um, so I, I don't know that one view dominates. Uh, I mean, the view that gets the most attention is the view of the big, big ag. And yeah, big ag um, defines a lot of this place. Uh, and when I talk about big ag, we have to make a distinction between big ag that's local, folks that, you know, that have acquired uh, 20, 25,000, 30,000 acres, and then the big ag that comes from afar, which is like John Hancock, and the Canadian Royal Mounties pension fund and retirement funds who come here and have um, really no idea where they're coming to. They hire a farmer uh, on the ground who's a custom farmer who's going to farm for them. And as long as they're showing decent returns, sometimes even if they're not, they're happy because they need to show a loss. So who dominates? Uh, it, it depends on where you're, you're talking. Um, but certainly, you know, the Westlands Water District, uh, the biggest uh, water district devoted to agriculture in the country, if not the world, you know, speaks with a big voice here. Do you, do you think that the irrigation districts generally or the largest farmers speak for the interests of the average farmer? I mean, I, I've talked to people who don't even realize that there are small family farmers in the valley, and there are a lot of them. Um, I, I don't think they do. I think the smaller guy who's got his easy draw of water because he's located in a place where farming makes more sense. Um, I think he allows the big guy to, to talk on his behalf. You know, farmers are pretty reticent, man. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to give it up. Um, I remember uh, Fred Salyer telling me that he was quite happy to die with his history on his pillow. The only reason he was talking to us it's because that uh, J.G. Boswell had kind of, you know, twisted his arm into talking to us. So, yeah, farmers don't like to talk. Uh, they like to whine sometimes, uh, a lot of times. You know, they, they whine when there's too much rain, too little rain. Uh, they whine about government intervention, but they never whine about government subsidy. So, um, and, you know, the ones that are doing really well, which is a lot of them, uh, you know, they don't want to, you know, have to talk about you know, that second home they have on the coast, uh, that Lamborghini that their son is driving. So there's all sorts of reasons to want to, you know, keep it inside, inside the family. Interesting. I, 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 my, my next question is kind of a longish one and consider it like a bundle of questions to do with, as you will, it's hard to not bring up Sigma, the sustainable groundwater 
Management Act when talking about, in particular, the San Joaquin Valley, but really large parts of the Central Valley, since the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is a, an attempt and a framework for having each sub-basin, essentially each community, live within their means and start managing their groundwater basins to put away water in the wet times to really see them through the more frequent uh, and drier dries that we're going to be seeing. And, and the question is, do you think that the efforts to comply with Sigma are going to lead to more of agriculture living within the means that nature provides? Is, is it going to bring a reality check to the, the dreams of unlimited production that you write about so frequently? Uh, just this whole historical continuum from the, the very beginning of uh, Western um, uh, arrival. You know, historically, it seems only some kind of a big forcing mechanism, whether it's legislation or litigation, a change in a political dynamic. And you describe the demise of mining when finally agricultural interests were in conflict and had more political power. Um, causes that that causes a limitation in the over exploitation of water resources for a particular purpose. And, and I guess the, the final little sweetener to put on top of that bundle of thoughts is, you know, can climate change be the force majeure forcer that gets folks to come together and figure out how we can collectively deal with the freight train of pain that's going to come at us when our snowpack melts out too early? Well, it has to. Sigma has to work. Um, you know, it, it took us 175 years to regulate groundwater, which kind of belies this idea that California is a, a progressive state, of, you know, in front of all the others. When it came to water extraction, it wasn't. So um, one, of the th one of the things that I do in the book is I trace the footprint of agriculture as it moves out from the areas where it made the most sense, the rivers, the, the alluvial soils to ground that was more marginal and then finally ground that should never be farmed. And, and it was invention that allowed this footprint to expand. 1920, when my grandfather comes here, it's the, the, the turbine pump has been invented. And now all of a sudden you can draw water from the ground. You don't need to be so close to a river and more marginal land is developed. And then those pumps go dry, land starts sinking in the great drought of the 1920s. And there's a cry to steal us a river. So we steal, we build the Central Valley Project and move these rivers, you know, southward. Um, so then you look at the invention of drip irrigation, which was supposed to save water. And you see that there's a paradox to drip irrigation. It actually allows farmland to move beyond uh, where the pump was to ground that shouldn't even be farmed. I mean, cows don't even deserve to be on some of this ground. But because that drip line can deliver a precise dose of water and chemical to the root of a, of a tree, you can grow the tree there. Almost, it's almost as if you're growing it hydroponically. The dirt is just there to stand up the tree. And so we've seen a great expansion uh, into areas that should not be farmed. Uh, in the last 10 years, the driest period in California, we have seen in the San Joaquin Valley alone an increase of 700,000 acres of permanent crops. And many of those permanent crops have gone into areas that are outside irrigation districts. In other words, beyond the flow of rivers and the central and state water project and are relying solely on groundwater, on ground that isn't so good. So yes, Sigma has to happen. I'm hoping that the Department of Water Resources finds the courage to really call out some of these sustainability plans that the, the locals are coming up with that are kind of BS. Um, uh, and, and when you talk to the farmers here, even the big ones, they will acknowledge that in the San Joaquin Valley alone, we have 6 million acres of farmland. They will tell you that if you add up the, uh, the acres that should be followed to get to sustainability, it would be about 1.5 million acres in the San Joaquin Valley alone. And this, this they, they, they will acknowledge and did. I mean, the head of the you know, water district in Kern County told me that in Kern County alone, they have 900,000 acres of farmland, at least 300 to 350 would have to be idled. So yes, I see climate change as 
a great challenge, but also a great opportunity. It allows for a kind of interference to be run, for politicians and others to find, and bureaucrats to find a kind of stiffening of the spine, a little courage where we didn't have that before. And not only for farmland sprawl, but the sprawl across the state into the wildland urban interface. A quarter of our population lives in the path of wildfire. Uh, that just can't be sustained. It's it, interesting. I mean, your, your observations on it, I think are really good and it, they fit also with, obviously I haven't spent as much time in the Central Valley um, as you have, not my whole life, but I've spent more time than any other coastal person I know pretty much um, in terms of just talking to people. And I, I really uh, saw the wisdom of folks, I always say in coffee shops and bars who said, we've got to do something. We've, we've gone way beyond our means and just in terms of what's right, but in terms of um, uh, whether their children and their grandchildren would be able to farm. So I do see a, ho a host of folks in the Central Valley who realize that they need to do something and it's gonna be very difficult. And hopefully between all of these facets, we'll be able to get there. Um, and fingers crossed, I think DWR is doing a pretty good job so far in calling those balls and strikes. And yeah. we've gotta be in it for the, the long haul to have people's back. But do you think it's possible that when you talk to farmers, they would envision a perfect solution being taking that 1.5 million from those last in lands, or does that seem too naive to think that would ever happen given the amount of money invested in those trees and the well, prevailing yeah. wisdom about that? I think that's where you have to kind of start. Now there's a lot of debate between family farmers and these ones who came in recently. In Madeira, you're having uh, family farmers three, four generations back saying, hey, wait a second, John Hancock, who, who came in the last 15 years is sucking dry our aquifer. So, um, and, and, and so, yeah, this is where, you know, it's gonna be tough. And what do you do with that land once it's been idled? I think some of it, you allow uh, those flows to go back into rivers. You allow for a kind of native ground to come back. On others, maybe you put solar panels like they're doing in the Westlands Water District. So there's, this is all room for, you know, and, and then and, and in some cases you're gonna have to, buy out some of those farmers and, and try to follow some of them that are more family. The, the, the hedge funds, pension funds, they came in as gamblers. They knew they're taking a gamble. So I, I have, I cry fewer tears for them um, if they have to, to retire. Um, I think Sigma is important. It doesn't eliminate the importance on the Delta and all that debate, a whole chapter, three chapters devoted to, you know, trying the voluntary agreements and how much water and trying to save those uh, endangered species of fish. Uh, that's a more intricate kind of give and take and all that. Sigma is to me a cleaner, cleaner way of looking at it and can really get some water savings, um, huge amounts. Yeah, it will be interesting to watch and interesting to watch whether it stays a competition between that reduction for that and for fish or whether it opens up a more collaborative space in some ways to, to, to live within our means, including uh, nature, which is you know particularly challenging area that I, I have a lot of questions about, but I'm gonna save them. Um, and and uh, after asking you to add it, it, time has gone way too fast and I wanna go to some of the audience questions, but yeah. do you mind reading one more well, here's Here's what I would suggest. Um, people can pick up the book, read it, judge for themselves. Um, why don't okay. we just, why don't we go to questions? Um, I want someone to ask about dairies maybe because I think dairies are something, mega dairies are something that we can't afford in California anymore for a variety of reasons. I'll upset my uh, Azorian Portuguese and Dutch friends, but I think we need to really look at a California without mega dairies. That will help too. Even as we're now subsidizing with millions and millions of dollars, these methane digesters. So we can explore that kind of, um, that paradox as well. So yeah, I, I say, let's let's go to the questions. All right, let's do that. Um, the first question we have here is, um, it's a question about Stuart Resnick and his support for the governor's committee to oppose the recall. Uh, what effect do you think this will have if the governor tries to rein in 
water use practices of mega land barons is quote, not my words, their words like Mr. Resnick. Well, I, listen, um, it's not, it's oil barons, it's water barons, it's land barons, it's big tech. You know, they, they're all given money to politicians. And the question is, is that money buying policy? And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's another book. Um, so, um, you know, Resnick is, 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 you know, he'll, he'll tell you he's a liberal. Um, uh, so, you know, he's, uh, the, the money he's giving, although he, he, he hedges things too. There's some, mm -hmm. conserv there's some Republicans. Um, I don't know how that's going to influence a statewide policy. Let's hope it doesn't. Um, Resnick has a problem right now that he's got too much land, too much, too many orchards and not enough water. And he's actually buying water from the Boswells. I mean, the Boswells are selling their state water when they get it. And then they're pumping the hell out of Tulare Lakes, the bottom, to get enough water to, to, to support their farming. I mean, they're selling water and not reducing their footprint. They're trying to maintain their footprint and sell water at the same time. And um, so, yeah, the, so this is what, you know, how long can this be sustained? I mean, we're gonna see some real things happen this summer. And if this drought goes on another summer or two, uh, you're, you're talking about too many almonds, too many pistachios, prices dropping. I think almond prices mm -hmm. are now two bucks. Uh, we've been, I've been talking about a glut of almonds for 20 years and they just keep expanding this market. I don't know that they can anymore. So what influence that buys? Yeah, it, it, it buys some. Let's hope it doesn't buy, um, you know, you know, change things that, um, that, you know, a path that we need to go on uh, to, to, because climate change is, is telling us. In other words, I'm hoping that the, the, the consideration of climate change is more than the consideration of what a particular baron has given in donations. Well, well, let's stick with politics for a moment before we go back to some questions about writing that came in. Um, someone asked that, that extensive roadside signage provided to motorists by like-minded coordinated ranchers cast the blame on Governor Newsom for wasting water. They also agree to blame this drought on Congress, I'll say Congress people and elected officials, some of them are women. Um, what's behind this concerted effort to influence passersby in this manner? Well, this began with Sean Hannity and Fox News 15 years ago and you know, coming out and talking about how the pumps had been shut down on the west side. And Devin Nunes, you know, young Devin Nunes was there saying, you know, these pumps have come dry. And there was that uh, comedian, um, uh, Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Paul. It, it, Paul, right, yeah, it was all fake. The pumps hadn't gone, weren't right. off. Right. And what they did is they picked a piece of land on the west, in, in Westlands that had just been harvested you know, tons and tons of tomatoes had come off. And the camera showed this land that looked like it had been fallowed. No, it had just been harvested. So it, it, it's, it's, um, it's just a, it's a lie. Um, now, over the years, uh, with more and more drought, some farmland has had to be idled out there, but, but their contractual rights never gave them, you know, the, the coverage of, of that they would get water during droughts. So, um, so yeah, and, and you know, Nunes floated this idea that it, it, that it wasn't really drought, that, that it wasn't, it was, it was kind of a man-made government induced drought and uh, that it was all, you know, the commies were behind it. And this is the kind of stuff that's taken root here. Um, and it goes back to the Confederates who came from the South in the 1870s and 1880s to take the first flow of the rivers and carve out the first farmland. This is a place that was an extension of the Confederacy. It's interesting. It's always seemed to me that it's been very partisan, that no matter how much a Democrat does, their name's going to be on that sign. Yeah, I think so. Uh, if not in the bullseye, you know, they, they actually had bullseyes saying, you know, 
murder federal judges. I mean, so it, it's 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 you know it's it's crazy. What's happened now is is as we're seeing more and more Latino politicians come to the fore, we're actually seeing the Latino populations do the bidding of big farmers and big developers as well, which is 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 kind of um, you know disheartening to see. Um, so you know, then that goes to the previous question, you know, the, the power of money on, on a local politician. You know, you've got, uh, there are a bunch of great questions here that we're not going to have time to get to. I'm going to, hopefully we, we can capture yeah, we these can and get them to you, but um, oh, there's so many. Can we um, go like 10 minutes beyond or no? Is that something I, we're allowed I, to do? I can. So okay. uh, let's, I think we can stay a few minutes. I'm waiting for Kate to give me the the hook, but uh, Kate, you should just come in. Yeah, I, feel, I think if people need to go, um, you know, at, at time, they should feel free to, and, and we are recording this so people can can uh, can pick it back up later um, if they're if they need to leave. Okay, so. let's do some fast, fast questions, fast answers. Okay, let's do it. All right. I'm just going to, there's so many good ones. Irrigation in arid areas can eventually lead to poisoning of the soil with salt and other minerals. So maybe the statement about areas that should not be farmed, wait, it just went away. I hadn't answered it. I hadn't asked the whole thing yet. Sorry, Felicia. It's, it's still there. It's on the answered tab. Oh, sorry. Oh my God. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you're really on it. I think that's really good. Um, there we go. Sorry. Um, so maybe the statement about areas that should not be farmed might be better stated as areas that will not be farmable for X years until the land is no longer able to support farming. Do the big investors know that the productivity of their investments have a time limit? No, I mean, you talk to the custom farmers who are farming for them and the big investors are kind of clueless. Uh, you know, they're playing for a window, a five, six, eight year window. Hopefully it pencils out. And if it doesn't, then they have a loss on the books that ends up offsetting all the big gains they've had. In writing the dreamt plan, how did you decide on how you would balance the storytelling aspect of your experiences with people in the valley with the historical accuracy of the complex history of water in the valley? In reading it, there seems to be this amazing interaction between the two, but how did you decide on the balance between them? Well, you know, some people who have problems with um, the, 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 the breadth of it, the heft of it, uh, find that those two things are sometimes um, are working against each other. I, I tried, I, you know, I tried to bring in the personal and the family when it made sense. You know, what was 1920s California like with, with the advent of the pump? Well, my grandfather happened to arrive at that time and I had happened in those, you know, those childhood kinds of ways to record much of his story. So I went back and had him be the storyteller a little bit. So hopefully, like the questioner said, you know, that one ends up, um, you know, making the other better and that I've achieved something that's close to being seamless, but some folks found it a challenge to read and to be, you know, they, they didn't want the family stuff in there. Some people didn't, and I thought, well, geez, how do I write this, uh, you know, as as some kind of stranger to the land? I, I can't. Well, that's great. Um, at this, I have to go to this one. I am going to go to a little bit more of your writing because people put those questions in early on. And and I mean, I, I, normally I don't call out the person who asked the question, but I I love that Rita Sudman asked this question because of course she's asking the practical, what do we do about it? Um, question as the the former head of the. Water Education Foundation. So she asked, Mark, can you give the audience the, the 10 points or main points to solve California water that you detailed at the end of your great book? Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to do all of them, but some of them. Yeah, yeah I, I, I didn't want to do that because, um, but, but when I was out there with the Oracle and he was describing how we had just overdeveloped all this land, I, I pulled out the notebook and I said, Let, well, let's, you know, let's try to solve some of this. And, you know, we threw out stuff, um, you know, dairies being one of them, you know, dairies, I mean, more water is used by cows than anything. Uh, the growing of silage and, and alfalfa. Uh, so, and, and, and the idea of California is we have such a unique blend of water, sun and soil that we should be growing things that only we can grow. And that's why I don't have a problem so much 
with at least the early plantings of almonds and pistachios, because those are things that we can grow only here, really, maybe in Iran. Um, but dairies can be anywhere. So, you know, getting rid of dairies, uh, having a real uh, successful implementation of Sigma can do a lot. Uh, uh, water transfers uh, can work, although we, we've, we've had a really weird way of trying to create this market. So far, it's been just farmer meeting farmer, farmers in Sacramento deciding that their rice crop isn't valuable enough, so they'll idle some of it and ship that water to almond and pistachio growers in the middle of the state. Uh, that's interesting to me. Uh, I worry about water marketing, especially when farmers are then allowed to sell water, which is a public trust, right? It's, a, it's ours. Sell that from farming and have it go up and over the mountain to developers or even our own developers. So converting farm water to suburban water, that troubles me. Uh, desal, I don't know. Um, you know, we, we kind of throw that out there. So there's, there, there are these tens in the last chapter called Holy Water that you can read about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of them will get us, uh, you know, if we, if we, we embrace them, we will get us partially there. The other thing is, is we have, you know, in my lifetime, California's grown from 13 million people to 40. How many more people can we take on? And if we do, how much more sprawl can we support? Um, this is a, a great question that was always fraught and still is fraught, but was always fraught before, uh, you know, nimbyism and, you know, all that. And, and, but now you wonder if climate change has made it um, more, you know, allowable to ask that question of how big can we get? How big should we get? Well, what about, I want to go back to the Central Valley a bit um, and then ask you a couple questions about writing. It, can you just personally, you, you've said it in so many words in so many places, but can you briefly describe what's most special to you about the Central Valley? Because it seems like a lot of people in California don't really know very little about it other than it's hot, dry, bad air, smell of fertilizer and pesticides, et cetera. And so this attendee wants to know, what do, what do you think is most special about it? <laughs> you know, I'll go back to Soroy and he had a love hate with this place. That's why he spent most of the year in Paris, or at least half of it. Um, uh, it it's a brutal place, man. I mean, you know, it, it, we've had this problem. We, we, we have failed because of a deference to industry, ag and oil, to solve, to solve the air. I mean, the air is it's brutal. My, my lungs cry out to live somewhere else. And I will eventually, maybe sooner than later, move somewhere else, continue to write about this place, but move to a place I could breathe because now the wildfire smoke laying down here, you're talking three, four months of, of basically being locked indoors with a bunch of HEPA filters humming day and night. So um, yeah, I have this love hate with this place. Uh, the love comes from some of the same places you hate. It's very weird kind of uh, psychological thing. Uh, I, I love the fact that people are um, not, they, they allow you into their room and in their deepest feelings. They, they aren't, I, I don't know if it's fair to say not sophisticated enough, but a lot of them just allow you to hear what's on their mind and they're not varnishing things up. They're not cleaning it up. Um, and so you get a, a, a kind of a reel that you don't get in, in places that are, let's say, more sophisticated, pretend to be more sophisticated, perhaps. Pretend to be. That's right. That's what I love about it, too. That's interesting that you do that, that you think that. Uh, here's a nice one. I, I followed Mark Arax's work for a long time. The LA Times back in the day was the perfect place to disappear into long form reporting and writing. Here's the question Do you have someone to whom you read your work as you're going? I read. Um, I had a professor once, a man named Roger Tatarian, who told me that when you're writing, the eye can fool you. Don't let the the eye be your guide. Let your voice. So I would read out loud. I write. I read out loud all the time, because when you read out loud, that shows you where you you know something. You have a hiccup in a sentence. Uh, you know something's just not flowing right. So yeah, I read to myself. 
Um, and then I have a couple friends like Pete King, who was a, 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 a former right. president, who uh, was a great columnist, wrote the California column at the LA Times. He, he's always my first reader. And he'll tell me where, you know, and he doesn't, he's not afraid to call BS on me. So, um, uh, so yeah, you, you have to, um, you can only get it, even at your best, you can only get it 80 to 90% there. Uh, you, the capacity to fool yourself is such that you have to have outside readers. That's really, those are words to live by for writers, I think. Um, another question, given that you were born and raised in the Central Valley and that your father's murder remains unsolved, have you ever considered writing a book on Earl Warren? Well, Earl Warren, the book has been written, unfortunately. One of my old colleagues wrote that. Uh, my dad's murder, uh, weirdly, was solved uh, basically upon the publication of my first book. One of the, the one of the conspirators who drove the gunman to my dad's nightclub, uh, a farmer turned grocer turned, you know, into a, a nightclub owner who had the hottest rock and roll club between San Francisco and LA. When I was 14, my dad brought Chuck Berry to his place, uh, the first integrated nightclub in the San Joaquin Valley. But um, after I wrote that book, the driver ended up reading it, and a couple things happened. Once, one, he got popped on a crime. Two, he felt enough guilt from reading the book that he came forward. So 30 years after the murder, it was solved. Wow. Wow. There are a bunch of questions about whether you are going to write about certain things. One, one simple one, when's your next book going to come out? Well, I, I, I have a book I'm, I'm working on now that I'm not sure if I'm going to turn it in, into a novel or if it's going to be oh. nonfiction. It's, I've got it both ways right now. And the, the novel allows me to bend a few things, bend time, compress some things, and not have to fact check, by the way, so I can get it out a little quicker than five years each book. But um, so I'm, I'm trying to debate between that and that. And then I'm, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm writing a kind of uh, uh, nonfiction book at the same time, which is a weird little juggle that's going on. And you'll just see which one pops out. Yeah, I think so. Yep. First. Um, do you have any thoughts on other issues in California in terms of either contamination or changes? There's a, a couple of questions about Kesterson, a question about the Salton Sea. Do you have opinions on other, on those issues? Yeah, I wish I could have dealt with, um, I, a Kesterson I have in the book, it's called the chapter called Poison Pond. And this goes back to that earlier question about, right, when you're farming ground that shouldn't be farmed, uh, uh, the salts and things are gonna bubble up, the water table's perched, and you're gonna get a kind of toxic situation, which we had. Salton, it's, um, I, I, unfortunately, I was only able to devote a couple paragraphs to the Salton Sea, uh, that wonderful history of how the Salton Sea even arrived uh, on the scene, you know, kind of uh, part nature and part man, um, and then a break in, the, in, the, in a dike, and then all of a sudden the sea out there. This is a remarkable place, California. I, I'm still trying to puzzle it out. I'll probably, you know, you know, people say, why don't you write about something else? I mean, I'm still trying to figure this place out, my own place. In fact, this one of these books goes back to a part of the San Joaquin Valley. It tells the whole story of race and other things. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm still still trying to figure it out. And, and, and I'm hoping I have enough health to 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 keep keep it going. Let's see. Well, there are a couple of questions about whether you will write more about uh, the wonderful company. Um, or, uh, and another one about the story about uh, Mr. Boswell ripping up your book. <laughs> so uh, this is my last character's question. Okay, so I'm going to okay. go back to history. So I, I don't think I'm going to write about wonderful anymore. I think that, you know, I would say maybe a quarter of the dreamt land is devoted to the Resnicks and wonderful mm -hmm. and all of that. So that, I think I pretty, pretty much told the story there. Uh, Boswell was interesting. Um, Rick and I decided to let him read the manuscript before it got published. Uh, we told him we would not change a word uh, if we didn't, you know, but we were, we wanted to see 
you know, if we, it was all the factual checking. So he was like a fact checker for us. I remember going out to his little lanai in Corcoran where he would come to visit and I plopped the manuscript on his table in this little kitchen. And it was, it was like this thick. And uh, he said, I'll have it done tomorrow. And I said, what? So he, he called me back the next day and it was about 30 hours later, and he said he had read it twice. Now, this I can't believe. But when I got there, the manuscript was even thicker because he had stuck a bunch of post-its in it, all the places he had problems. Okay. And wow. so, so a, a lot, some of it was great. You know, no, that wasn't 1957. That was 1956. Okay, boom, we'll change that. But other pro areas were problems. He said, you know what? Uh, we really didn't have black cotton pickers here. And I said, what do you mean you didn't have black cotton pickers here? I've interviewed scores of them, okay? You have black churches on the other side of Corcoran. He says, nah, nah, he just didn't see it, okay? This was a blind spot he had brought with him as a boy from Georgia. Hmm. And then, so we went through all these, and he, got a, he was getting a little upset when I said, no, not, we can't change that. And then he said, listen, this title, the King of California, I can't have that. When I go to the Bohemian Grove and all these places, they're going to make fun of me. They're going to say, oh, here comes the king of California. And he said, I said, well, well what would you call it? He said, well, how about a king of California? <laughs> <laughs> I said, who's going to buy a book that says a king of California? And then he thought a little bit. He said, well, um, you know, I'm farming in Kings County. What if you called it the king of kings? And I just started laughing. I said, man, that's been taken already. Um, so uh, I left there and I had a sense that we would never talk again and we didn't. The secretary later told me that she had given him the book to sign his name. And he got so angry that he threw aside the pen that she had handed him, picked up the book and it's not a small book to tear in half but he did, he tore it right in half. Wow. So that's that story. Interesting, we're thinking about, one last question about larger than life characters, this one from Felicity. It is, so many of the big characters that you talk about that are central to California's water and ag history, Sutter, Henry Miller, J.G. Boswell, your grandfather, came to the state from a distant land. Did they try to remake California or or the San Joaquin Valley in the image of their homelands, if their visions didn't exactly fit the land they found, did they adjust their visions um, to push hard to make the land fit their visions? That's a great question. Yeah. Of course, it came from Felicity. Of course. Um, no, I don't think they did because nothing on this scale, there was no model for this. This was a kind of new model. There, there still isn't anything that's, that, that, that kind of rivals this. Um, oh, hence they, the title. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they just dreamt it all up. I mean, Henry Miller did have a dream. He had a dream when he was a kid in Germany. He saw this um, cow in a dream that had a certain branding on it. And this was the branding of the, of the first ranch he bought in, in, the, in, in the middle of California. Henry Miller is fascinating. It was fun to, t to use these characters as characters almost like in a novel and tell their story. I had this secret about Henry Miller. I knew that um, his wealth had gone into dozens of trust funds for various people that are alive today, great, great, great grandchildren. And I knew that one of them was Tucker Carlson, who had hmm. a very nice trust fund. And I thought, mm, I'm going to write about this. I'm going to bring it out. Well, the New York Times on Sunday doing that three-part series on Tucker Carlson had a little bit of Henry Miller in its story and how he was a trust fund baby. So I, I guess I sat on it too long and they took it. Um, but yeah, these characters and Henry Miller, all the etchings, the grooves that he put into the land in the 1850s and 1860s, you go out there and they're still there. I mean, his buggy is still there on his original ranch in a, in a storage facility. So the, again, the past isn't so far away. In fact, it's, it's the future. Well, 
it, we, we need to close now. So I'm going to give you, I hate to close. There are more questions and I have a bunch more questions too, but um, quick question to, to close on. Um, what keeps you up at night? And then what gives you hope? I kind of answered that. I think uh, obviously climate change keeps me up at night. It is, you know, I have three children. I have a grandchild. Um, how could it not keep you up at night? But it also weirdly gives me this hope that we will find the courage to do what's necessary because it's there over us. Will we find it too late, too soon? You know, I, I, I won't live to see that answer. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. I guess so if I asked you the magic wand question, if you had a magic wand, what one thing would you do related to water in the Central Valley? Would it have to do with that awareness that we're all in this together and climate change or would it be something else? Yeah, I mean, you know, more and more farmers are, are uttering the word climate change. And I think the magic wand is, is that, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think that solving climate change might be, it might be incompatible with capitalism. And will we mm. be able to give that up? That the ghost of that up, I, I don't know. Um, so I don't know. It's uh, a magic wand would be for folks to see that that we're all in it together and to put put aside all these divisions. But all I've seen in the last six, six seven years is a rising of a, a kind of rhetoric and and you know here. I mean, this is you know I, I'm in a place that is is between red and blue, but the red is very vocal. So Yeah, it's too bad. One could hope that that, that quality of realness and neighborliness that pervades the Central Valley could be an antidote to some of those forces of division and distraction. So let's, let's hope that the, the forces of neighborliness and good and optimism for the future can somehow yeah, recover or win out. Thanks so much, Mark. This was really great. I, I, I think, Kate, I should probably turn it back to you to close, but thank you so much for the opportunity to spend an hour, a little bit more than an hour with you. Um, and again, thank you to all of our listeners for joining. There's almost 200 of them. There may have been over 200 uh, earlier before we hit the, the top of the hour, but um, thank you for all the work you do the heart you put into it and the skill uh, and for sharing a little bit of it with us today. Well, Felicia, so, I, could, I couldn't think of anybody better than you to do this. And you've been so generous about my stuff. I really appreciate that. And, uh, and, you know, just someone so knowledgeable, we could have gone into the weeds really deep into the weeds and we didn't. So uh, thank you. Thank you to Stanford and um, you know, all that. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Kate. Great. I will keep it very brief and just thank uh, both of you, Mark and uh, Felicia, for your time and wonderful conversation. And thank all of our attendees for coming um, uh, and, and joining us. And we hope you'll join us again at our next event. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks a lot. See you.